Welcome, welcome to the NCS podcast, uh, NCS Masterclass Series. This is John Rosenberg from Westchester Medical Center and New York Medical College. I'm Stefan Mayer, the co-host also from Westchester Medical Center and New York Medical College, where I work with John. And we're here, we're joined with a very special guest today, Dr. Lori Shutter, Professor of Critical Care Medicine, Neurology and Neurosurgery, and the Director of Neurocritical Care for the UPMC um, Health System, I think. Yes. Um, Thank you. So D Dr. Shutter is here to talk to us today about traumatic brain injury. So welcome to the podcast, Dr. Shutter. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. So we'll start off with, with a case. Um, basically, uh, a gentleman comes in after a motor vehicle accident, um, has uh, GCS, we'll say AT, local um, E2, M5, intubated, and um, CT is multifocal brain lesions, right greater than left contusions, uh, cisterns open, no midline shift. Walk us through a little bit about um, how you want to manage this patient, the hyperacute setting, acute setting, and, and really the things things that kind of that go through your head and how we can keep this patient safe and promote um, you know promote as much recovery as possible. Yeah, I think the primary thing and uh, the what we teach everybody is our goal is to avoid secondary harm. And we know that there's going to be physiologic changes that the brain is potentially going to swell. Um, you didn't give me an age, so it, the, the amount of swelling may vary based on how old the patient is. But younger people, you're going to get a lot of swelling. You can get disruption in cerebral blood flow. So our goal is to try to, uh, we can't undo the original injury, but we hopefully can prevent secondary injury. And the ways that we will do that is, um, get them to a specialized ICU with expertise in managing the neurotrauma patient. We believe in um, monitoring the patients and we will place in uh, uh, both uh, external ventricular drain and a um, continuous ICP interparenchymal uh, ICP monitor in this patient. So we actually have uh, our neurosurgeons here drill two holes. So once I've gotten their head CT, patient comes up to the ICU, we rapidly get the monitors in place. If there is a surgical lesion, surgery comes first, obviously. Uh, patient goes to the OR, then comes to the ICU. They get monitors in quickly. Our monitors, as I said, are an EVD, and we have a second hole where we put a quad lumen. And in that lumen, we will place a intraparenchymal ICP monitor, our brain tissue oxygen probe, um, uh, temperature recordings, and depending on the flavor of the month, we might place um, a microdialysis catheter or we might place a depth electrode for spreading to polarizations. Um, those are the big ones we use now. Uh, then from our nurse's viewpoint, it is keeping the head of the bed elevated, making sure that we have adequate access, central line in place, um, the basic ABCs, uh, and um, optimizing things like glucose temperature and um, uh, glucose and temperature management and sodium control. So we will place um, cooling catheters in patients and try to maintain people at 36.5 continuously. Um, uh, if they're hyperglycemic, um, we have use sliding scale insulin or an insulin drip if it's over getting close to 300. Uh, for sodium, we like to keep it in the mid normal range to start. Uh, so around 140. And our setting for our respiratory therapist is to keep the PACO2 between 38 to 44 to start. Okay, we don't like to hyperventilate patients, so we will start with uh, normal capnia. So those are kind of the, the first things we start with. That's great, um, Lori. So let me, let's break down a little bit your, your multimodality montage. Um, I wanna start by asking, um, you used the term flavor of the month. You probably work, you have a lot of different intensivists, yeah. different neurosurgeons. Is everyone on board with the multimodality monitoring or do you have skeptics in your own unit, in your own department? Um, <laughs> we There are skeptics to the benefits of multimodality monitoring, but our standard is that 
we place the ICP monitor and we place the brain tissue oxygen monitor and we measure brain temperature. That is standard in everybody. When it comes to, and, and even that, I will say that there are some critical care faculty that question the benefit of the brain tissue oxygen monitoring, but that has been decided by us as a group that we will do it and we place it. Um, regarding the other options, as I said, flavor of the month, it's probably more what is the study at the time, uh, because we do have a lot of research going on. So are we doing a cortical spreading depolarization study? Or are we doing a microdialysis study? So that determines the other ones. Great. But the standard but, is ICP and brain tissue oxygen. Now you said using a, a depth electrode yeah. um, for um, CSD monitoring. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas I think that the spreading depression monitoring um, paradigm had all started with uh, ECOG strips right. on the bridge. So how is that working for you using a depth electrode? Yeah, um, actually, you can pick the uh, cortical spreading depolarizations up a little bit easier, in my opinion. You don't have to worry about uh, the removal. And you can use this also in people that are not getting um, a, a surgical procedure done. So if there is a surgical procedure and we have the study going on, they often will place the ECOG strip. Uh, but in that situation, we like to place the depth electrode as well to try to see if there's correlates. And I actually forgot to mention that all of our patients within about 24 hours get hooked up to continuous EEG. And we monitor continuous EEG for about 72 hours. Awesome. That's, that's Great to hear. I think if I could summarize for our readers, the key for the, for the high grade TBI is you want to be as proactive as possible. You're not really, everything is set in case there's a temperature issue, blood pressure issue, Correct. any type of uh, metabolic ICP issue, you're already ready. You don't have to call someone to place, call, call the fellow in the middle of the night to place as a call a neurosurgery resident in the middle of the night. Everything is set and ready to go. Great, great point, John. Um, I would much rather be proactive than reactive because reactive takes you time. And that time is, I mean, we know from stroke, time is brain. Uh, we have to think of time as brain in every acute neurologic uh, injury. The faster we can do things and the more prepared we can be, I think we have better opportunities to help the patients. Um, great. So Lori, uh, you mentioned the research and, and what I'd like to do now is um, pivot to boost the boost concept. And what I'm interested in hearing about is the origin story of boost. Where did this idea come from? Who was involved in this? And um, for some of our listeners that are interested in building academic careers, how do you get from an idea to a big multi-center NH funded trial? <laughs> Um, wow. It's kind of a long story. I'll try to be brief. Okay. Um, you know, brain tissue oxygen has been around for quite a while. I'd say the people that really started it and brought it to the attention of the TBI world were Alex Velatka, Claudia Robertson in the U.S. I mean, this mm -hmm. was being done over in Europe. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I just as an aside, I, the first time I heard a talk about it, I think it was Andy Unterberg, but I'll never forget it because it was October 2001. So for people that were alive, <laughs> the yeah. war had come to an end. Yeah. And it was one of the, the, air, the airports were empty. Yeah. And I, I went to Cleveland to go to this neurocritical care conference. And I was really, really smitten with the whole idea. I thought, this is too cool. Yeah. So, um, so yes, our, our, our colleagues in Rottenburg were doing it. Another early adopter was the San Francisco group, Jeff Manley, Guy Rosenthal, Claude Hemphill. Uh, they started with it early, but probably who published on it the most between Jeff Manley, Guy Rosenthal, and then Claudia Robertson and Alex Veladka. And Claudia and Alex actually made it part of their kind of routine care for patients. So these few places started using this tool and talking about it. And uh, I think it captured the attention because if, if you believe in the concept that, that after any kind of trauma, the key is resuscitation and the key of resuscitation is oxygenation of organs. Well, what organ is more important to oxygenate than the brain? You know, and our trauma colleagues 
will worry about kidney perfusion and gut perfusion. Where's the concern about lung perfusion or, or I'm sorry, brain perfusion? And it, I think it took us as the neurointensivists to start pointing out that that this is really the important organ. We have to perfuse the brain. We have to oxygenate the brain. So the concept started growing. Then there was Ramon Diaz Aristia, um, myself, and there was a small group of people. And I think, I don't remember what year. I wish I was as good as you were with years. Um, but I know where we were. We were in Santa Barbara, California at a uh, national neurotrauma, international neurotrauma meeting, sitting in this small room with the beach wide open in front of us. But we sat there all day and talked about how do we do boost two? How do we do a feasibility study on this to see if you could get separation? Is there a way to monitor brain tissue oxygen and show that we can treat cerebral hypoxia? Um, this was a long time ago, and that's how Boost 2 started. Boost 2 was two, 10 sites. Um, we finished the study. Uh, we actually had to stop early because we had achieved our goal. We had shown separation and feasibility. Now, it did take us a while to get the article published. It came out in 2017, where we finally said the results. We presented it for a few years before, um, kind of a little slow on the conversion. But um, Boost 2 helped us decide to move forward with Boost 3. What was the funding mechanism for Boost 2? Did Boost, somebody get an R01? Or? Yeah, we, we actually um, went through the NINDS and we got a grant, an R01 for, well, it was a U uh, because it was a multi center mm -hmm. group. So we had a, a U award to get that uh, as a phase um, two study. Yep. Um, then what really helped Boost, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, the net and to the siren networks. Once you started having these large groups that were doing acute work in uh, neurologic conditions, it brought together all these people wanting to do um, early intervention therapy and it gave us an infrastructure to build on so protect was like one of the first examples for brain uh, for um, progesterone and tbi and that was through the net um, network which evolved into the siren network and boost and another study called hobit which is uh, hyperbaric oxygen a phase two study in hyperbaric oxygen and tbi those were the first siren studies that got up and running and allowed us the infrastructure you need to do a large phase three trial and our funding is through the NINDS. Hmm. Then when we got it started, of course, we got funded in um, our letter of uh, award in October 2019. Um, well, actually, it was a little bit earlier than that, but we actually enrolled our, we had our first site activated in October 2019, and then COVID hit, Bang. and the world stopped. Again. <laughs> again, right? <laughs> world stopped again. So um, we, thankfully, the NINDS has recognized this. We basically had, instead of a first 12 month for our first year, they gave us 18 months um we had to gradually try to bring sites on they have been supportive of a supportive of us which is great and we are finally up at our uh, almost our full number of sites um and we're we hit our halfway mark we're now over that uh so we are showing um better enrollment numbers great right. one one question that i had too is so I think there's certain patients that we we all we all want to push for um, multimodality monitoring. That case in point being the first patient we discussed. But let's say we have a second case. Maybe uh, a 34 year old uh, woman comes in, um, was hit hit by a motor vehicle, has a unilateral lesion, uh, midline shift, taken to the OR, decompressed. Initial GCS will say maybe say seven seven T. Decompressed now now in the ICU. Um, has it has a good decompression? 
Are you yeah. talking about a subdural, John? Yeah, basically a traumatic subdural, maybe okay. right side, maybe a little contusion in the right right frontal lobe. Bone then, off. Um, it's decompressed. Good decompression, and then exam exam improves to maybe we'll say GCS nine ninety, uh, localizing, opening eyes. Um, your exam, you don't sense that the patient is under pressure per se, based on their exam and based on the re the post op CT imaging. Is this a patient you want to pursue multimodality monitoring on? And 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 if so, uh, take me a little bit through about your what your thoughts are and, and the risks and benefits. Yeah, but, you're, you're... but again, I just want to clarify: is the bone bone back on or is the bone off? Uh, we'll say the bone. We'll say the bone is off, just to make it a little more a little more difficult. <laughs> yeah, posing a nice, challenging one there. Um, well, if the bone is off, now I'm. Uh, one thing that we can really watch the patient closely if the GCS is up at nine uh, and we have a reliable exam and we're not having to sedate the patient for other things. So you have to look at this whole picture, right? So if it's isolated TBI, it was a subdural, um, it was a, a nice clean evacuation, post-op CT looks good, the bone is off, the flap is not under pressure, right? You can you can feel brain pulsations when you place your hand lightly against the skin flap. Then I am okay monitoring that patient more with kind of just clinical monitoring as long as they are showing a trajectory of improvement and they stay above an eight. But if I have uh, trauma surgeons coming in and saying, um, you know, we're going to have to go back in and address this thing in the belly, or orthopedics wants to fix their, their massive pelvic fracture, and we're going to have to sedate this patient, we're going to monitor that patient. Because if we at all think we're going to lose the exam, we want to have these monitors in place. Mm. Now, if it's a pure TBI, the monitor I will always go to is my continuous EEG, just to see what that looks like. And again, I use that, not just are they seizing or not, but what am I seeing as far as um, focality? Am I seeing anything that's concerning for um, non-compliance? Am I seeing things uh, that suggests disruptions in cerebral blood flow, then you may discuss, do you place monitors, okay? So it is, it is such individualized care, and that's something I think we have to really emphasize. We have this tendency sometimes to clump patients into one category. This is a TBI patient. It's mild, moderate, severe. Well, I'm sorry, the GCS is, is such a nonspecific Thing. And and uh, we've all seen that the patient you're describing that ends up doing well, but we've also seen the patient that has the same GCS that is going to have multi um, compartment hemorrhage that's not going to do well. So I think you have to look at each patient individually, balance it, and be prepared to become proactive and place things. But sometimes you can monitor as long as you can follow the exam and you can do non-invasive tools. And let's not forget the benefits of um, ultrasound for looking at midline shift at bedside, the benefits of transcranial Doppler, the benefits of optic nerve she sheath decompression, the benefits of pupillometer. It's thinking of multimodality monitoring, that's something we also use in every single patient. So let's Let's also remember that we have a lot of tools that don't require us putting things in patients' heads, but we can still see what's going on in there as long as we're, we're, we have a, a, a quick trigger finger to do those things. Lori, I want to ask you another question. It's, it's really fun to hear your philosophies and, and the way that you practice, and, uh, but we all, we all work in environments, uh, and it's always a team sport. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about the wake ups? And I'm all I'm asking because when I when I moved to my current wonderful locale, the fantastic, you know, you know, decked out, 19 bedroom ICU, the whole thing. Nobody had ever. I just felt like people were not used to 
waking up the trauma patient. Yeah. It, it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, you um, know, they're, they're storming and, you know, whatever. But I'm kind of like, this is ground truth. Yeah. This is the ultimate form of monitoring. And, you know, there's nothing you can't fix with 50 milligrams of propofol. Yeah. <laughs> or fentanyl. <laughs> you do a wake up. What's yeah. the culture of wake ups in, in your now place? Ketamine. And, huh? Ketamine now is it's ketamine. Good... Now it's 50 milligrams of ketamine, ketamine yeah. will fix everything. Um, <laughs> we start our our ground level. We examine somebody every two hours. If we are seeing disruptions and changes in our multimodality monitoring that worry us, we will start spreading that time out. But we start with every two hours, we do an exam. Mm -hmm. And at least every 24 hours, we do spontaneous breathing trials and a spontaneous and a um, spontaneous awakening trial where we just turn off the sedation and see. Now, if I turn off sedation and the ICP goes from 10 to 18, like immediately, um, I'm going to be standing at bedside and watching this and mm -hmm. seeing is it going to level out? Is it going up to 18 because that's physiological and they're waking up and they're scared as all get out because they don't know where they are? Or is it going up to 18 because the way uh, because waveform is looking bad and it's poor brain compliance? So again, it's looking at the patient individually, but I do believe in waking these patients up unless they are showing us that they don't have good autoregulation, that they cannot maintain, it's physiology based. We do have patients that we only do um, twice a day exams and that's those, those times correlate with nursing shift change, not with physicians work schedules. It's when the nurses change because the nurses need to see the exam and we have to be there with the nurses. So it's driven to ours, to their schedule, not ours. Interesting. Um, okay. John, any other questions? Um, I guess, is there, tell, tell us, Dr. Shutter, is there anything new in the, um, in the realm of TBI that we should be, that we should be aware of anything new and coming out? Well, we didn't really talk about CPP opt. And, you know, the cognitate study is is fascinating and opening the doors that, you know, this is something else that needs to go on this um, monitoring that we need to assess for cerebral autoregulation. And that is one of the benefits. We really didn't talk about the benefits of brain tissue oxygen monitoring besides cerebral hypoxia, but it gives me so much knowledge about um, brain physiology. I use my brain tissue oxygen not just as a number, but as a tool to assess physiology. I do FiO2 challenges, mm -hmm. I do CO2 challenges, I do MAP challenges. I actually will change parameters and see how brain tissue oxygen responds. So I know what the right CPP is for this patient. I know what the right PaCO2 is for this patient. What do they want? Um, so if you're going to place these monitors, whatever monitor you place, use it. It is not just a random number generator. It gives you insight in true physiology. And that's what we are as intensivists. We're physiologists. Let's get at the bedside and learn the physiology. Um, so if I can't do the exam, I want to be able to assess physiology. And how you, you briefly, you alluded to one way to assess autoregulation, but tell us a little bit at the bedside, how are you doing your autoregulation ass assessments when you when you examine the patient? Yeah, um, the the tools I have available, I, I unfortunately don't have ICM plus, I don't have all these fancy things. So I actually rely on my map challenges with my brain tissue oxygen, okay? So I will uh, find out where the patient, patient's foundation is, where are they, what's their um, baseline number. Uh, I change nothing else, but I will drive up map by 10 points using uh, some presser. Usually for us, it's norepinephrine. So I'll drive the map up by 10 points and I'll see what brain tissue oxygen does and what ICP does. If map goes up and ICP goes right up with it, they don't have brain tissue, uh, they don't have uh, um, autoregulation. Yeah. If I, map goes up and ICP stays the same and brain tissue oxygen goes up, then we may need a higher CPP to 
fully oxygenate that brain. And this patient can tolerate it because they have autoregulation because ICP did not go up when MAP went up. So you use this truly as a physiologic tool to help guide you. So that's my technique. I know other people use um, you know, ICM plus and can calculate CPP opt, but we, we all need to have some way to assess autoregulation. Yeah, um, I wanna just add to that. Um, with the, the first debates that I remember about PBTO2 monitoring were around um, just flipping up the FiO2. Oh as opposed to uh, you know, augmenting CPP and to, to another extent, you know, uh, uh, manipulating uh, CO2 and tidal mm -hmm. CO2s. Mm -hmm. And um, I've, I've, I use the FiO2 trick or challenge to make sure the monitor is working. Right. It's just like turning yes. the stop clock on a track. Exactly. In any way form. But, th but then we try to run them like 30. Yeah. Because my feeling is, it's although you're measuring the partial pressure of oxygen in the brain parenchyma, um, it's functioning as a, you know that way. In that way, with the FiO2 down low, it's functioning as a perfusion monitor. Mm -hmm. um, it's not exactly the same thing as cerebral blood flow, but it's well correlated with it. Yeah. And you know, and it, you know, a function of oxygen delivery, oxygen diffusion out of capillaries through mm -hmm. the nerve pill and oxygen consumption, if you just, um, cause I've met neurosurgeons that are like, oh, just put everybody on hundred percent. The number goes way up high, yeah. but then it's not functioning as a perfusion monitor anymore. Right. And right? not just so that, it, you it, have potential it's like for- It's your Right, and it's the potential for harm from oxygen, for <laughs> hyperoxemia. Yeah. So one thing, uh, the OxyTC study came out and showed no benefit right, from brain tissue oxygen monitoring. The Fran French study uh, of mm -hmm. uh, brain tissue oxygen monitoring um, in TBI patients. But you have to look at that study is that their initial treatment for any low brain tissue oxygen was to crank up FiO2. Yeah. That was their first treatment. They also, there's a number of differences um, and there will probably be some things coming out in, in Lancet soon talking about the big differences between OxyTC and Boost and Bonanza to um, say, this is why we need to keep going because uh, um, Boost is, has a complicated algorithm, true, but that algorithm is to help allow us to be physiologist in managing our patients rather than just going up and cranking up an FiO2 dial. Mm -hmm. that, that algorithm was my Bible as a senior resident. And then as a junior fellow, that was my algorithm at night when all, you know, when your thought, pro when your mental status is slowly, when your GCS declines by half a point. Right. And I say with my fellows to my, my young fellows, I give them that algorithm as well. Cause I think that you want that in place, but also thinking through the physiology of everything. Where is it a perfusion problem? Is it is it a lung oxygenation problem? All this, I think, very helps an intensivist just playing that playing that that chess game and, and understanding what you basically understanding what you're doing to your patient, and then what your patient is also what is you know what the actual injury is doing to them as well. Exactly. We post that algorithm on every patient, whether they're in boost or not, it's posted on the door. <laughs> so because we have a lot of different people at night helping to cover our patients, it's like, read this. And if you don't understand it, call me. I don't care what time it is. So, um, uh, Winding down now, what a great conversation, Laurie, and thank you so much. What system, if any, do you guys use for data aggregation for your multimodality um, data? We had a partnership with Dick Moberg, and he very um, kindly uh, helped us develop. He already had his uh, the Moberg CNS monitor, mm -hmm. but he and his uh, engineers built a software program for us called CarePath that we uh, placed on the CNS Moberg that basically is the boost algorithm on the CNS Moberg. So it um, uh, that's what we're using to collect data. 
and it alarms at all the physiologic things where we want it to alarm. And if you don't remember the algorithm or can't find that laminated sheet of paper, you hit the device and the care path has the algorithm and it comes up for you. And so you can hit a button and say, okay, it's a tier one. What are my tier one therapy options for ICP being elevated? And it lists all of them for you. Hmm. Uh, so it is a uh, great tool that is allowing us to capture the real time data continuously. Uh, no matter what monitor we have in the patient, it's capturing it. Uh, and it's going to be a, an interesting uh, process. So if people are interested, we're going to have a lot of data on these patients. And there may be options for secondary analyses and ancillary studies breaking down this data afterwards, because we're having hemodynamic data, ICP data, brain temperature, everything that is being monitored on this patient is going into the Moberg system. And it's all going to be on the cloud, and it's all going to be available for people to study. So if you have questions, approach us, uh, Ramon, myself, Bill Barson, and uh, we'd be happy to talk about potential secondary uh, studies, ancillary studies, or secondary analyses after the fact. Awesome. Wonderful. Okay, so I think we're, we're going to wrap it up. But uh, again, Lori, thank you so much for um, uh, spending a little time with us today at the NCS Podcast Masterclass Series. Thank Again, you so much. Yeah. It's, been a, yeah. it's been a pleasure. So <laughs> it's something I'm passionate about. And believe me, I can talk a lot longer, as you probably can sense. I could go on and on about <laughs> my passions related to this. Awesome. All right.